Hey there, and welcome to How'd You Get That, where we solve all your math and physics problems. I'm David, and today we are taking a look at our first topic in physics, kinematics. Particularly today, we're gonna to be talking about one-dimensional kinematics. This can be moving along a straight line or maybe a curved line, but in such a way that we're only talking about one spatial dimension. It could also be moving in a vertical direction, for instance, if we're talking about free fall. But first, what is kinematics? Kinematics is the study of motion, and it has three basic building blocks, position, velocity, and acceleration. Each of these properties has its own associated sub-properties, for instance, speed for velocity, or displacement and distance for position. But in general, these three building blocks, position, velocity, and acceleration, help us describe any situation in terms of its motion. We're not concerned in kinematics with the reason for that motion, for instance, the forces that might be involved. We'll be getting to forces later on, but for now, we can neglect worrying about those forces and just focus on the motion itself. The last property that we're going to be using in kinematics is time. Now, time is not a property of a body per se, but it is a property of the system. It measures the duration during which a certain process takes place. So the first building block is position. Position is a vector. It is the directioned distance away from the origin, which we mark with a zero here. If we take a look at the number line here and say that I am placed at the number five, that means my position is five i hat. Since position is a vector, I do need to include my unit vector notation here, which is what that i hat represents. If you need a primer on vectors, you can see that episode here. But for now, we can just say that my position is at 5 i hat. If I were at the placement of negative 3, for instance, that would be at a position of negative 3 i hat. You'll see that position must be measured from some arbitrary zero point, which we call the origin. This is true in one dimension, two dimensions, or three dimensions. In this way, position is an absolute quantity. It's measured from a very specific point, and it is measured from the same point for all bodies within the system. So even though that point itself might be arbitrary, it is absolute within the context of the system. The other two position-like quantities we're gonna be talking about, displacement and distance, those are relative quantities. They are measured in relation to two different positions. Displacement is the direction to distance between two points. Those two points could be the origin and another point, but they can be two any arbitrary points in the system. I say that displacement is directioned because it is a vector. Displacement can be written like this, delta vector x. You'll see that that delta is very important. The delta indicates that this is a change in position. In fact, displacement measures the difference between the final position and the initial position. And since position is a vector, so must be displacement. In one dimension, I might have an initial position of five i hat and a final position of negative three i hat. Therefore, my displacement between these two points would be negative three i hat minus five i hat or negative eight i hat. In other words, moving from the position five i hat to the position negative three i hat means I need to move negative eight units or eight units to the left. And that in fact is our distance. In general, I can write my distance using this formulation. The distance is equal to the magnitude of the displacement vector, which is equal to the square root of x final minus x initial squared. Now you'll see in one dimension, the square and the square root just cancel out. And so that my distance is simply x final minus x initial. But I write it this way with the square and the square root because we're gonna see that formulation again in two dimensions and three dimensions. In two dimensions, this expands into what is essentially the Pythagorean theorem. And in three dimensions, we just get the three-dimensional version of the Pythagorean theorem. We'll see that in a later episode. So position is a vector, displacement is also a vector and distance is a scalar. It is the magnitude of the displacement vector. Position is an absolute measurement, whereas displacement and distance are relative measurements. Okay, now onto velocity. Velocity is simply the displacement per change in time. The other way to think about this is it is the change in position over change in time. 
But velocity doesn't need to be constant. Often, it's not, and in our everyday lives, velocity is rarely constant. Instead, the displacement per change in time, or the change in position per change in time, is actually the average velocity of the system. So if I'm traveling along from a position zero to a position 100 meters away, and I cover that distance in five seconds, my average velocity for that entire trip was 100 meters divided by five seconds, or 20 meters per second. But that is essentially the average velocity of the entire motion. If that motion varied a bit, I can still have covered the same distance in the same amount of time, but that doesn't mean that my velocity was constant throughout that motion. To find the instantaneous velocity at any point along that motion, I would need to use derivatives. In general, we can say that velocity is equal to the first derivative of position. The related quantity to velocity is speed. Speed is simply the magnitude of the velocity vector. And again, like I found the distance being the magnitude of the displacement vector, I can find the speed as simply the square root of the velocity squared. Again, this seems a little bit more complicated than we really need it to be, but it is important that this squaring and this taking the square root makes the velocity vector actually into a scalar. And speed is a scalar, not a vector like velocity is. Finally, acceleration. Acceleration tells us how much our velocity is changing per unit time. In essence, it tells us how much we are speeding up or slowing down in the motion. Mathematically, you'll see that acceleration is equivalent to the second derivative of position or the first derivative of velocity. In order to find the magnitude of the acceleration, which doesn't have its own special name in this case, we can take the square root of the square of the velocity vector. Again, in one dimension, this is pretty straightforward. But as we get to two and three dimensions, the formulation will look a little bit more complicated. Notice that when I find the acceleration, I can have a negative acceleration versus a positive acceleration. It's important that when we set up our coordinates to begin with, we set up what is the positive direction and what is the negative direction in any coordinate system, 1D, 2D, 3D, or any set of dimensions. In this case, we'll say that to the right is positive and to the left is negative. If my acceleration then is positive and the motion, the velocity, is to the right and is also positive, that means that the whole object is speeding up. If the acceleration is positive, but my velocity is in the negative direction to the left, that means that I am actually decelerating. I am slowing down, even though I have a positive acceleration. Because the velocity and the acceleration are opposing each other, the acceleration is essentially taking away speed from the initial velocity. We'll see that this is an important property. If the acceleration vector points in a different direction than the velocity vector, that means that the acceleration is kind of pushing that velocity vector in another direction. In 1D, it can be thought as pulling the velocity vector in the opposite direction that it wants to go, or pushing it in the direction it wants to go if they're in the same direction. If the velocity is in the positive direction and acceleration is in the negative direction, I get a deceleration or a slowing down. But if the velocity vector is in the negative direction and the acceleration vector is also in the negative direction, that is still speeding up, just in the negative direction. Lastly, you'll see I've marked some of these properties, position, velocity, and acceleration with a subscript x. In one dimension, this doesn't make a whole lot of difference because we're just working on the x line, the x axis. If we were talking about in the vertical direction, I might label my position y or my velocity v sub y, or my acceleration a sub y. I do this to note what axis I'm working on. This will be important, especially in two dimensions and three dimensions, when we start moving in more than one axis at a time. So any one vector might have both a y component and an x component. In the next episode, we'll be taking a look at this problem. But in the meantime, why don't you try it out yourself? The question is this. If the position of a particle can be defined by the function, the vector x of t is equal to 
to cosine 3t i hat. At what position will the instantaneous acceleration be zero? We'll need some calculus for this, the derivative of both the sine and the cosine functions, as well as the chain rule. But try it out yourself, and I'll see you in the solution.